in preparation for this uh, talk today and be able to share it with you all. Um, and I appreciate your time. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, I've got some photos um, put together. Let's see where to start. Um, so it's gonna be pretty free form. Um, and I have kind of a chronological order to how I'm gonna um, present what I've been doing in, in years past. But please um, ask any questions while I'm talking. I'm really happy to make this more of a conversation as well. Um, but I thought it would make sense to start with what brought me to Marshoots in the first place and how central it's been to my practice, which has taken a lot of forms and I've flitted between a lot of styles. Um, but looking back at my work, even in just the last couple of weeks, thinking about this talk, it's really amazing how much these threads have continued from, well, sometimes before more shoots, but a lot of it date to my time there. And, um, you know, some of the key takeaways that I've, I've had from my time in our shoots include like letting the, the paintings breathe a little bit, letting composition breathe, um, not needing to close the contours of forms and letting people in, in, inject their own sort of imagination and letting the brains do the work of linking things. I've learned so much about um, what, how paintings, images, writing to all operate on the kind of this nexus between the artist and the viewer. And you want to let it be this dialogue. And so much of the way that we talk about composition at the Marshoot School allows for that. It's allowing for the viewer to come into the picture as well. And something as simple as just letting forms remain a little open and not defining them all the time and being kind of pedantic with like closed out, outlines and contours allows for that sort of symbiotic relationship between the viewer and the artist. So just to show you a few of the, the pieces that I um, I did in my time in the Marshoots school, which was in 2015, I should back up a little bit. Um, I went to the school in 2015 for the fall, just for the semester. Um, just four months that had a totally outsized impact on, on my life and my art. Um, and I did a lot of works that didn't work <laughs> and some that I look back on and I still think of that fondly. And I think, um, I think still work today um, from, you know, after years of going through this much more postmodern a master's program, I look back on some of these works and I still really like them too, even if they were getting somewhere. And I don't think, I think so much of my time in X was getting works to this like furthered point. Like they didn't really arrive at working some of the time. And I, I use working as kind of a, a way of talking about like they harmonized. Um, so this is one that I, I, I liked a lot. I just you know, capturing that light on Mozart Victoire was just so, such a engrossing experience and required working so quickly. Um, I haven't done that much plein air painting um, in the years since, but gosh, every time I look at this photo, it just makes me want to get out there and do that again. Um, here it is afterwards. Some more um, little paintings. Some drawings from that field. Some of the still life works. And this was such an, a, a departure from the work that I was doing before. Um, this was in Giverny, and it was me kind of returning to a bit more of a. a precise style um, in watercolor, but 
I still like this one too. How all the, how the water just made all of the colors merge. Um, and then the Marshute steps, um, which is, I think this might be my favorite little work from my time there. Um, and it's busy, but there's still, I think, like some breathing happening, um, but it's very, it's it's all over, Just it, but it feels kind of united still to this day. Um, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> thanks, Alan. Wow. I don't think it's busy. No, okay. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a good way, it's very full. I find that I have two kind of paths in a lot of my work. I tend to go um, maximalist with some of my paintings, um, as you'll see. And then more recently, I'm paring things down and focusing on basics and shadow and light and these simple binaries that we see all around us. Um, This is O'Neill from the portraiture session. Oh, O'Neill. Ah, wow. My good friend Becca came with me to X and lived um, with me with the same host family. And um, this is a painting of her and I afterwards. And these were all done after the fact now. So I returned to my undergrad program at uh, Westmont College in Santa Barbara. Um, that's where I graduated with a fine arts major um, with minors in global studies and um, biology and art history. Um, I just couldn't <laughs> what I wanted to do. That's I actually, it? Yeah, just, just that. Um, I started at Westmont uh, pre-med actually, and art was always just a hobby. I didn't think of it as anything but um, a pastime. And by the time I got to Mars Shoots, I was really at this inflection point where I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue with my biology degree. And I was really considering switching over to art as my major. Um, at that point I was double majoring actually, but uh, it was starting to seem um, like a lot. <laughs> and I, I needed to make a choice at that point. So, um, when I did get back to Westmont in my, to start my, uh, or at the end of my junior year, I, I chose art and, um, and that's why the biology major was relegated to a minor because I didn't finish the, the major coursework. Um, but Marshutes was very instrumental in teaching me the seriousness of the artistic pursuit and how I, it made me want to give it my all and really, really see what I could do. It was captivating being around artists who all, we were speaking kind of the same language. We were engaging with our environment in similar ways. Um, I had that to a degree with my, um, the, my cohort in the art major at Westmont, but it's a very small liberal arts school. There's only 14 of us that graduated with an art major. And it was a little less cohesive in terms of the um, uh, art pedagogy. It was wonderful, um, but there was a lot of different streams between you know more academic training, um, working from still lifes and honing these technical skills to intermedia classes and art art criticism and digital media. So I was sampling a lot all through my undergrad education. Mm -hmm. And then I get to Mount Shoots, and all of a sudden it's this cohesive um, philosophy. And we're still looking at the masters and learning from them and drawing from them. We're making our own work. We're looking at, um, we're, we're reading a lot. You know, Flannery O'Connor made a huge impression on me during my time there. Mm. So you do have these different streams, but they all pulled together a lot more. They converged and, and a lot of the work we were making was around the same motifs. And, and it was just, an, it was intense. It was a very intense experience. Um, and it was also focused, like my time there, I wasn't doing 
biology classes and I wasn't working at the same time. And I was just like kind of living and breathing art among artists and, and it distilled life a little bit. And it's hard to find that outside of a program like Marshoots, especially now, like right now I'm in South Carolina. My husband and I just moved with our baby here. So I'm, I'm a mother, I'm working full time. I'm trying to have a studio practice. Um, and then there's all these competing things calling for your attention in life. And just to have that, that step outside of kind of your, your normal, whatever that is, was a huge, huge, um, it, it, it just made it a pivotal experience. Um, so these were all painted from memory um, of the studio. That's where they're a little bit more, um, lo maybe loosely rendered. Um, mm. Wow. Uh, that's just from your imagination? I mean, are you looking at a drawing or are you just painting it? Just painting it. Mm. Um, and then when I got back to Westmont, I was doing, um, I was actually still doing some plein air work and I remember getting up early many mornings in Santa Barbara and, um, doing quick little sketches like this, I mean, just eight by eight inches, um, a lot of eucalyptus trees around Santa Barbara and Westmont college. So those colors started influencing the work a little bit more, um, and, yeah, just trying to do sketches in, you know, 15, 20 minutes was, was such a fun challenge. I didn't get to do them as often as I liked, but it just, it was, I had all this momentum from the school that I was just continuing with. Um, and then I was, I took a painting class when I got back um, from Westmont or from Marshoots and with my favorite professor, uh, Nathan Huff, who's been, who's gone to X and worked with you oh. all a little bit. And Nathan's just been so instrumental in my life. And um, these paintings came from his class, these two. Oh. And these were looking at old photographs. This is a photograph of um, me and my siblings when we were little in California on the beach and letting some details fade. It was a challenge to paint as if they were memories which they were, these are old photographs, and let the, the choice in what, I, what I'm representing, what got brush strokes um, in a way, trying to have that form follow that function, right? Of thinking through where might details escape. And I think oftentimes it's faces, faces kind of, when you think back on memories, they're harder to call up, but you get these like, yeah, the shapes um, still are retained. Um, mm. What's that? This is just a study. This was from a photograph um, from a magazine that I was looking at, but I just took a lot of license with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I used a dark background, which was unusual for me, but I wanted mm -hmm. to let the form merge with the background more and feel like the brush strokes were more, they, they were added. They, I wanted them to feel very topical here and let that background still emerge. You know, with white, a white background coming through, it feels like breathiness. Um, but when it's a dark background, it feels like kind of a grounded form. So I wanted the hair to kind of bleed into the background here and let the light feel chunky. And so that I think was important. Now looking back on it, light has been something that I, you know, I've used as more of a topical thing and it's a way of flattening. Um, it comes more fully into my more recent work with uh, this thesis painting that I did a couple years back, I think especially, but using white as the last layer to kind of knock back the colors and flatten 
but white on top just has been this thoroughfare for me. Um, another little watercolor rendering here, though the white background merges with the figure much more. So these feel like kind of oppositional pieces that work together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Wow. And I don't even remember what the source photo was, but it was a source photo, I believe. But again, I just like took a lot of liberties with it and tried to make it very complimentary in the color scheme and feeling wet and watery um, and reflective. Um, this went along with this painting, it was in the same sort of little project where this was a, a photo that I took during my time in my shoots in a bar in Sevilla during a little weekend away. And um, it was a more recent memory. It's more defined than this, I would say. But uh, I still love this one today. Mm. And that was actually behind me over there. Um, and then in my senior year, we have kind of this capstone project at Westmont. And um, we get to focus on it for really the whole year. And for that project, I chose to uh, depict my friend, Becca, who was actually with me in X. She was that, she was in this photo um, here. And she is just this dear friend still today. And um, I was living with her in, in California outside of or off campus. And she has a, a brain condition and she was going through surgery and it was uh, quite a hard year for her after brain surgery recovery. But I saw her living with her, prepare for surgery, have surgery, recover from surgery and to go through all the motions that attend that. And it was a very surprise thing for her. She thought she had been um, in the clear for, for many years and then it emerged again. So seeing her go through this process um, inspired this series of paintings. Mm. These two I think are, are the strongest from that. Um, where for the first time really, I was looking at figuration as more of a psychological representation um, and started connecting with uh, these other influences um, contemporary artists that were using, and you know, a lot of the German expressionists and, and so on, who were thinking of representation as psychological portraiture. Um, so this was the whole series uh, in the process, but it goes through from like more of a still stable through like this fracturing and um, kind of resolution, but there's, it pulses between um, stability and instability. And if I wanted it to feel somewhat cyclical, I think I could have done more with how I arranged it to make it feel cyclical and not so linear, but um, it, importantly, it never felt really linear, like there was stability and then ending with fracturing or vice versa. Um, so I started thinking more in terms of the serial format at this point. Um, and was thinking a little bit more critically about why I wasn't showing the face here, you know, what that means in terms of hoping it could be stands in and universal and less biographical, but more conceptual. The, the, the major program was getting me to think a little bit more uh, critically about my work in, in other capacities. And I, so I had this experience at Mars Shoots, um, which felt so cohesive. And, and then my undergrad at Westmont nurtured that in a lot of ways, but I kept kind of introducing new streams of thought and making me focus on more of the contemporary art world, um, trips to LA and um, more of a critique format on each other's work. And we'd have, I'd have other people in my cohort who were doing work in fabric and 
um, textiles. And so there was a bit more of a, there was a lot of diversity in terms of what was being produced. Um, Jenna, was this in your MFA program or st you're well, still- This undergrad? is still undergrads. So this was the end of my undergrad work. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point though, I now decided to full, I was majoring in art and I was committed to that. And I knew that I wanted to go into uh, a master's program. So I began looking at those uh, in the year that I was graduating. Um, but then I married my husband that same that same summer and uh, took a year to make commission work. And I decided I needed kind of a breather after uh, my undergraduate time to just make some more and have it be less structured by classes and critique and just the academic rigor. And that was a very telling year. We were in Chicago. We moved from Santa Barbara to Chicago where he had a job. And I was already kind of scoping out the Art Institute at that time because I had heard such good things from my professors about that program. And it was recommended to me by many people. And I really enjoyed going there. And I, and at the time in Chicago, I was making trips into the city and connecting with people there. And yet I was still taking a year to make work. Um, and I had this commission from the college to do 10 um, paintings of cathedrals from around the world, which was really tapping into my hyper-realist bent that I had before and they knew me to have. So we, it was work like, let's see, why is it freezing? Oh, there we go. That was some of the commission work. Um, I was doing this series of 10 cathedrals. So St. Patrick's here, Il Duomo. Um, we had St. Mark's Basilica in Venice and the, the college president saw me do this work. I had shown it at the college before, decided in high school. And he saw that and it made an impression. So when I graduated, or, and I, I, think, I think you saw this one as well. Um, also of Venice, taking a second to load here, but he saw that, gave me this commission um, and it was really, really uh, valuable to you know, structure this art or this contract and negotiate on my behalf and think about materials. I did it wrong. I think I broke down to me making like $3 an hour that year, but it was really, really instructive. And I just got to um, have this time to kind of just be for a while um, without all the outside uh, influence and noise of kind of the educational environment, which I love. But I think that was really good for me to just step outside of it for a year. Um, so I made these paintings um, and I have a lot more on, on my website. These are just four of them, four of the 10, but- oh How big are those, Jenna? Uh, 24 by 30 inches. Wow. And they each, I mean, they took so long because they're, they're so detailed. And I was working from um, source photos, but if I didn't take the photo myself, I didn't follow it explicitly because you know, for obvious reasons. So I was always like compositing these photos and creating this this composite image that I melded together. So so that there's no photo just like it um, on the internet or out there, and it's it's truly um, original in some in that way. Mm. But it's it didn't feel like my work, like work that I personally was invested in beyond just like honing these more realist techniques and I it's satisfying doing this work but um in that year it was definitely focused on on this series and I didn't have a lot of other um avenues really nurtured um in terms of my own practice and I wasn't sure what that really meant at that time now looking back I've learned that 
when I get, when I feel urgent about art making, it's almost always out of response to something in my life that gives me a sense of purpose and care. It's usually inspired by other people. Um, the first one was my friend Becca, who had gone through that brain surgery. I think that was the first instance where I felt really compelled to make work about something, about an idea, about someone's experience. Um, and before I, or before that, I, you know, I made work that I in, was invested in, but um, I look back on my my work and it feels like three distinct episodes of times I felt urgently needing to respond to someone else's lived experience. Um, let me see. So in grad school, um, actually, let me jump ahead of this. I think this will make more sense. Um, in grad school, my a lot of my focus was on processing um, this experience my dad was going through. So the, the senior year of Westmont was um, colored by the fact that like my family was going through all this uh, uncertainty around what was happening to my dad. He had this, he has an early onset brain disease that we were figuring out at that point. And it was changing his personality and it was uh, really reducing his capabilities. But he, being very young, he was in his 40s when he was diagnosed with this, um, was fighting back against it and hiding you know, his kind of impairments through some, um, uh, it, it, but it was just really, it happened quickly and fast, and he's still around today. Um, he's in uh, memory care here in South Carolina, which is part of the reason we moved here. But this disease, posterior cortical atrophy, um, is totally changed his visual spatial processing. It was one of the first things to go, and it was really peculiar watching him mm. move in space. And so during my grad program, I ended up choosing uh, the School of Art Institute of Chicago the next year after um, after taking that year to do some commission work. And um, we moved from Chicago the next year after I got accepted at the school, a little confusing, but I was part of this low residency program for my MFA, which was um, unique in the structure. So it invited all these artists from around the world to come for the summers together in the city where we'd have these classes. Wow. And I like kind of like camp, like it was this like mountaintop experience every summer in Chicago and the, the city just comes alive in the, in the summer and there's all this energy. And then we all go away for the rest of the year and do these mm -hmm. online courses and delve into our practice a little bit more. And that really worked for me at the time too, because, um, I wanted the intensity of the, that summer experience and, and then to be able to kind of retreat and ground myself in my work a little bit more. I didn't want to constantly for two years just be in and out of the city. I'm extremely introverted. So it was like really nice for me to have like that social engagement like time and just like throw myself at it and then, and then find more energy in my work and in solitude. So for that reason, it worked for me. I also loved that it enticed all these artists who had more working, they were working and or they had families and they were just further along in their careers. I found that the two year MFA program, especially in big cities, uh, is appealing to really young people. And I wanted to be around more diverse people in terms of age and background. So this program was incredible because it brought people together from as far as Iran. Um, there was a lot of Canadians, there was um, a lot of Americans as well. And from backgrounds, including performance art and um, photography to painting, um, spoken word. So it was really just this amalgam of people um, and ages and experiences. So, I like that. And then thirdly, it really worked because 
at this time, my parents moved to South Carolina um, from California and my dad had to quit work. He retired really early and they had to just change their life entirely. And so my husband and I went and lived with them for a while to see if we could help out and just feeling like we needed to be with, with them at the time. And it was also helpful because we could live there and I could throw every penny at this MFA program. And that I was, um, you know, they're, they're a little pricey. So I, I really needed that help too. And then just living with my dad during that time um, and seeing him operate in space, there was this galley kitchen that uh, was just confounding to him at, at times. And it was really interesting to see him like not be able to gauge, gauge the depth of it. And um, it just mm. made it all so apparent to see him like in this sort of like channeled space where um, depth was collapsing, the sides were collapsing, and it, I could just imagine the claustrophobia that he was experiencing. And, um, and in that time, he would, in kind of his more unguarded moments, explain how he was seeing. And it was always so fascinating, um, the words he would use and what he would admit to, like, how colors were inverting and um, and it was becoming like he sometimes wasn't, he would say things that were just so, there were statements like you have red eyes, not it looks like you have red eyes, but you have red eyes now. Like, so these inversions of color and reflections were extremely disorienting. And I found that I would just needed to make this work around his experience and trying to imagine what he was going through because when you're when someone you love is going through this um, upending experience, you want to help somehow. You want to fix it. I'm a fixer, and it, there's nothing you really you can do. This is a it's a, a terminal diagnosis, and um, so I found that I could at least process things through trying to understand his experience um and I ended up making it took me a while to understand what I wanted to make I was just in I was kind of throwing things at the wall I was painting this still life that's brain plaque because the condition is just a an abundance of uh, amyloid plaque uh in the brain that's causing this kind of obstruction of pathways, which become became very conceptually, um, it became a focus of mine, like this idea of pathways and obstructions and circuitry. And I date that kind of preoccupation in my work to this time, but I was just painting plaque at this point. So this was, this is what plaque would look like under a microscope. Um, wow and the, like tau proteins and amyloid beta plaque. And here I have that white being superimposed kind of on top. The white was last where it kind of creates, it feels kind of wave-like, but it kind of uh, aggregates around these shapes. Is that oil? Mm -hmm. It was oil. Oil and counts, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Jenna, real quick, before you get further ah. along, the one of your, father in the kitchen that looks like a like a multiple exposure photograph that's mm -hmm. a painting uh that's a that's a photo that was a multiple okay. photo. Okay. yeah so I was um yeah good question I was taking some photos not often of him though that one I did have of him um I did make a painting from that composite photo I just didn't really like it that much <laughs> so I didn't include it um but I was creating composite images because composites seem to reproduce that sensation of collapsing and layered experience. Um, and that's how he would describe things. Like it was hard to, if it's hard to gauge depth, one way to do that through a photo is to impose different foregrounds on it, like create foregrounds that are kind of competing, I should say. So foreground, background, we're constantly competing in these composite photos. 
Um, and, and sometimes I would invert colors and uh, I was just creating this kind of source material. Um, this photo is a little blurry. I'm just gonna, eh. That's blurry, but um, holy moly! It's this. It's a painting of a terminal in O'Hare. If I can find a better photo of it. Oh well. Um, it's a painting of this uh, airport terminal, um, and I chose that because of the it's a high you know it's a iconically like liminal space right Inter airports are international areas so um now that liminal is such a buzzword at the time i was really interested in it and uh this idea of like everyone always being in transit and moving through space and and in this shared experience of change um was it just felt like it kind of cohered as a subject but also it's highly reflective space with this large large essentially hallway so this idea of like not being able to gauge depth could come into play in a more dramatic way um the reflection um and how disorienting reflective surfaces were could be heightened here so i was really going for like maximal sort of uh exploration of his experience through this image. And also he he flew a lot for his career. He was always flying around um, around the world and and uh, the it's supposed that his lack of sleep, because he was always taking benzos for for his sleep, was probably uh, exacerbating the brain condition and caused maybe to be more to be more early onset than it could have been. Um, so he was always flying and in airports and it felt just like a, a subject that fit. So here I just uh, started warping the figures and doubling it. So this was from a composite photo that I took in that airport and inverted colors and edited it in Photoshop so that it achieved in the source photo, what I was going for. And then in painting, I could take that just a little bit further with our, my choices around color. And um, so this was pretty large. It was 24 by 36. Um, and I did it, it took me a long time for one of the years in my master's program. Um, and it felt like it was the, like I needed to do this kind of work, um, but ultimately it was very, um, it was very biographical. And I, as much as I am, I've learned that I'm very responsive in my work. I always want to make work about something that I care about in my life. I find that it's more sustainable to do work that has How do I say this? Actually, right now it's uh, the work I'm doing um, is going to be very biographical, but I wanted to make it a little bit less vulnerable for myself. Like this work was very vulnerable. It was very much about this like painful thing in my family's life, and I wanted to process it. But I don't think I could do that kind of work every year. I'll just say that. Um, and so you worked on that painting for a year. Almost, I'm yeah, yeah. Fascinated with the technique, yeah. I have questions about the how you did it, really. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's oil, it's oil on canvas. Is that right? Yes. So, when you did that painting, did, would you work? How how did you? Um, how would you say that you learned how to paint like that in terms of the? sort of the realism and the the detail and, and the, the way that you've created the uh, perspective. Do, yeah. you, do, do you have a gift for that or did somebody teach you how to do that? Um, 
I think that it, it's mo it's mostly that that's kind of a gifting. Um, wow. I think I kind of work in two modes. Like part of what I loved at Marsh shoots was thinking of a picture as a whole and working from every aspect and bringing it to this point of completion together and working mm -hmm. on you know, this corner and this corner all at the same time so that it like builds slowly and emerges kind of as this picture in stages. Um, and when I approach something like this, it's very different. I do mm -hmm. like to hop around and bring it kind of to completion together. And I don't just work on like this area and slowly move my way over to the other side. Sure. Um, yeah. I am kind of you know, doing the underpainting and then slowly adding these layers to get it to this like shininess that it has. Um, mm -hmm. But I am looking at a source photo here. So rather than looking at a subject in nature and and feeling engrossed in this experience of looking, which is so different from this approach, I'm looking at the source photo and it's a very, it's a very drawn out, process instead of these like 15 minute little sketches in nature I'm doing this like comprehensive you know, project of this painting and I usually use the grid so I did learn that technique from one of my professors at Westmont um, Scott Anderson and uh, he has this much more realist bent he's a illustrator so mm -hmm. I think of it as sometimes like that illustration versus um, art sort of dichotomy, but he taught me these techniques around like uh, transferring images from source photos to final paintings. And I was leaning more on that vein of education. So using that grid, I could transpose details from this source photo and make it all uh, to scale on this larger painting. Wow. But really too, an image like this adds, you know, you don't have to, like with the church paintings, you know when the perspective is a little off. Here, the point is to make perspective off. So there's a lot more leniency in this kind of image and I could have mm -hmm. more latitude with the choices and add things. And that was that was more of a creative challenge that I liked with this. Um, yeah. Built slowly, for sure. And I could also just use colors that weren't in, in this photo. And I was just able to like make it hyper uh, sensational in a way. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the, the, the master's program that I had at SASC was so different from my time at Marsh Shoots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I chose, and I, I look back on that too, and I was so interested in these other ways of approaching art making, looking, surveying kind of the contemporary art world, and as an undergraduate student, really not knowing what to make out of a lot of it, I wanted to enter a program that, uh, with openness, and just learn why people are making the work they do, how I might understand these uh, trends in contemporary art and the artists that are making work that was just challenging. And I wanted to, to grapple with that. And, I, and it was certainly, it was certainly good for that. I, I positioned myself in a place where it always felt like the, it felt like a place to explore what art I, I wanted to make um and in fact the program had permission as one of its kind of foundational values like we want they wanted people to just try something new and and for me that was really great because you know I didn't I, painting felt like my anchor but I started realizing that I liked writing a lot too and photography, I never gave any credit to uh, it as a as an art form in its own right. And I still have a hard time. I don't call myself a photographer, but I take a lot of photos <laughs> and they work their way into my art in different ways beyond source photos now. 
um, and they certainly did for my thesis and for work today. Um, but I always still have that urge to make a photo of painting. <laughs> and, and so this environment in the master's program um, with all these people from all their backgrounds was, uh, it always made, it felt like the footing was always really loose in terms of like, I didn't know what my practice really was. And I don't think that's a good place to be for a long time, but it was really good for two years. And yeah. it stretched me in a lot of ways. So I had that, like this project with my, with my dad's um, perception. And then I kind of ended that chapter. I was like, okay, I feel like that painting kind of, that, that was, some sort of resolution that I needed to have made that painting. And now I had to move on and I was at a loss for what I was gonna make going into my last year in this master's program when I had this thesis upcoming. And I was like, I need a new new project and just started creating um, this uh, really curating life and collecting images that were resonating with me. And just coming up with source material at this point. Um, and kind of throwing everything on the wall. And at the same time, Seth and I decided to move from South Carolina um, where we were living with my parents to California um, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, that's where I'm from. And we just felt like we needed to, uh, have, you know, the next few years should be there. And we were just going to invest in our careers and travel to see family. It became apparent that um, my dad's condition was going to continue, but slowly. And it didn't feel like I needed to be there for family at that moment. I'm back here now, but I'm really glad we had this kind of detour through California um, again. So we made the move to California right before my last year in the master's program, um, moved back to Santa Barbara, and Santa Barbara came really, it directed a lot of the colors and the things I was looking at. Um, the light is beautiful in Santa Barbara and it was constantly inspiring. Um, and I was just thinking, I was turning kind of my, the view back onto myself as source material at that point I'd made photos of my friend Becca and paintings of her, my dad's experience. And for this culminating project, it's not this last year in my master's program, I wanted to make it a little bit more of a, an expose of myself because I hadn't really done that before. And, um, and so I, I don't have these photos actually, but I asked my husband, Seth, to um, I created these like prompts in my life, like all these little, like I was creating games and ways I could like create circumstances that would prompt source material. Um, and one of them was if you wake up before me, cause I was, I was bartending at this time and I was getting back really late in the, in the morning, in the early hours of the morning and I was sleeping in, which is not like me at all, but I was he was often getting up before me. And I said, if you wake up before me, take a photo of me sleeping in bed. Very odd, but we've made this kind of game out of it. And over a month, I gave him that prompt to take a photo of me while sleeping in this bed because it was very unguarded. And I was interested in the framing device of the bed and how my body would be positioned as a form within these like four walls all the time. So every morning, if he got up before me, he would take a photo and I composited those into similarly to what I'd been doing with my photos of my dad in the kitchen, collapse those so that it felt like time was collapsing a little bit over this month period into this single image. And, um, and I just made this a series of like 30 different composite images and so I was giving these little prompts in life, um, using the camera a lot more, whether it was Seth using it or I was kind of searching out images with this camera that I had. Um, and I ended up making my painting from that composite image of me sleeping in the bed, which um, 
ended up being this painting here. Um, Jenna, what was that last image? Was that a picture? This, what was that? So that this one, um, so I was using this camera a lot and it's an, it was a super old camera. It was a great camera, but really, really old. It was my dad's from when we were little kids. And it eventually died that year. Um, like the shutter just stopped working and died. Um, but uh, it was having all these issues with the shutter closing. And I loved that for the effect that it was creating with these images. And it was making them blurry and it added the sense of motion. So I was very upset when this camera just went kaput. But um, I just, it was a product of, uh, malfunction really this image and that had been something I had worked with in the past I don't have that some of these images but when the, I was printing a photo and the printer uh, malfunctioned and printed a bunch of cyan and um, it made a, an image really splotchy I've used that in the past to create paintings so images born out of um, out of accident I think that's a very fascinating thing um, and sometimes they're really unexpected. And, and those unexpected, especially when you have a, a vision for like a source image and it comes out wrong in a printer, it jars your expectations. And I find that just embracing that can be instructive. Mm -hmm. So in the past, I've done this sort of images born of accident thing, and then this photography, I just started really enjoying the, the sensation I was getting from some of these photos. Um, and taking photos of my environment, this was just a palm tree outside of the window in our bedroom, um, started doing something that started in France in that it was very much being aware and attuned to surroundings. And it was thinking of, you know, painting in, in X was so based out of sensations. And it was the convergence of like what you're seeing and also your imagination, right? You're always making these choices. They're born out of, um, the sense of harmony, but also, you know, if the wind is blowing a lot that day, it changes how you're painting or if it's really cold, like it was very grounded in this embodied experience. And, and with photos, it's very, very different. Like I'm using this uh, third party of a camera and that's involved, but this, this camera was happening to make photos that were aligning with how I was seeing space and, you know, having just moved and having all this transition and this, as I was explaining, this kind of lack of footing with my own practice at the time due to this very challenging, critical um, master's program. This is how I started seeing kind of the world and it felt appropriate. Um, and it wasn't always malfunctioning, but some of my favorite photos were from that. Other times I was just paying attention to the light on the walls and um, capturing these images of light and shadow became quite a meditative practice. And I would wanna search them out in the day. So having that attention to light coming through a window and the shapes it was making on the walls just became this new kind of game that was um, that I that I looked forward to every day, and I'm still collecting photos like this. So if I see you know, and I love how it can be just this happenstance thing. You could be making coffee in the morning, and you see this light on the wall, and if it's really, it, they're always changing because of the way you know the Earth is towards the sun and the time of the time of year. Um, how the lights filtered through trees. So they're always changing and they can just surprise you. So I still collect these photos and have made work from them, but sometimes I just like the photos on their own as well. I have um, printed out some of the photos that I've worked with in the past. 
just shadows of um, trees against a, a wall in Santa Barbara and bushes against pavement, palm trees and tar kind of mingling as forms on the concrete here. More yeah. light against pavers. So you have a lot of horizontal and vertical axes when you look at the ground and the world this way, when you're taking walks, you're looking at windows and walls, everything's framed already for you. So I feel like just looking at shadows and light within the context of the world framing them for you to enjoy is really a beautiful idea and one that has been um, just the source of wonder um, in little tiny ways. It just, it's just subtle little moments of appreciation throughout the day. And then shutters have been one of the more frequent images. I just think light coming through these striations and revealing little bits of the world beyond those slats um, is just evocative to me. So, and it, it it's, I don't take it very seriously, these photos. I just snap them and sometimes edit them, but usually I don't, I just let them be. Um, but I learn a lot about myself through what I collect, the, the subject matter that I'm collecting constantly. Um, when I, cause I taught at Westmont, I taught principles of art and a drawing class um, at Westmont uh, for two years. And a lot of these students that I had, you know, they don't have their, a style yet. And that's okay, like I'm still figuring out my style, but I think I was encouraging them to pay attention to what caught their attention, what patterns they found in the subjects that, and images that grabbed their attention. And some students really kind of, I saw a couple of them really lean into that and have this thread through a work in a semester, even though there are all these disparate projects um, they would kind of create this um, body of work born out of a, a thing in their life that was really capturing their attention at the moment. So um, I just have internalized that own prompt for myself and I just continue to find these, these shadow and light images throughout my day. Um, and sometimes it happens on canvas, it's another framing device. And I just thought that that's a, just a, a different way of looking at light and all of a sudden it becomes a figure ground relationship on a canvas and um, you can position the canvas to capture the right shapes and all of a sudden you're interacting with canvas in such a different way. It felt very performative. So here I am still in my master's program thinking about stuff like performance and painting as a convergence and um, but it was kind of life-giving just to be playful about uh, what light could be, making paintings uh, based off of that. And- That's a painting, right? Yes, that's a painting. Discovering like, how can I add color to, you know, you see this canvas, uh, the canvas that doesn't have light on it becomes the colored portion and just inverting the way I was thinking about light a lot at that, that time. Here, white is still applied on top. It's not. It's not the white of the canvas because I didn't prime this canvas. I just painted right on top of it. Um, so, so I'm adding white. But what's the other one? Is the other one a photograph of a lighting as a lighting effect on a canvas or? Yeah, is yeah. This is just a photograph. Um, and I, I, I took it because I just wanted to remember like playing along with the, like, the light on the canvas and how it fell um, and framing my own sort of light and shadow compositions. Um, it's interesting, the comparison between the photo and the painting. Yeah, it's not exact, it but it was, and I don't beautiful. think 
looking at this from a, a photograph. I was just remembering how light fell across the canvas in this wow. kind of like splatter shape. Um, and yeah, you know, getting back into small projects, like I had that huge project with the terminal, airport terminal, and I just wanted to have little smaller bite-sized paintings based off of like this, it's a, it was visual sensations, right? It was just uh, seeing this light fall on a unprimed canvas. And that was inspiring to me. So little paintings I could complete in an hour or so. And I was also looking at old paintings that I didn't like and thinking about how I can, um, I was kind of refashioning them. So I was adding these, uh, light and shadow shapes on top of old paintings just to explore what I was letting come through um, and making the painting kind of an underpainting that was revealed in certain ways, letting the white be very uh, wa the thin washes of like titanium white so you could still see through it, but it cooled everything and um, fogged it. So just explore uh, this one, I don't think I have the full painting. Um, where is that behind me? But um, became much more interesting once I added this layer of shadow and light shapes on top of it. And these shadow and light shapes here were pulled from the comp composite photos of me in the bed where the sheets and the folds of those sheets were creating these kind of waving, undulating sort of forms um, and creating shadow shapes in those forms. So all, all of a sudden just seeing images much more in terms of shape, um, shape and shadow and light. So did your teachers give you grief for uh, working <laughs> like this? No, yeah, no, they, I mean, it was, yeah, they were very encouraging. That's why that program was so good for me at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, here I am with, it's my like thesis project coming up and I'm like moving across country and just creating like doing these playful paintings and trying to understand what is capturing my attention at that time of life. And they were very supportive of that. Um, and, and I think that there was not much of an expectation for what this thesis needed to be. So I, and everyone's thesis took such different formats. It was a very permissive program mm -hmm. and I love that. Um, and one of the takeaways from that program that I think I still kind of adhere to in a way is that form follows function a lot of the time for that school of thought. And it's, it was, you know, they took it, I think sometimes a little far, but the idea behind the work was kind of the star and every choice made in terms of representing that idea had to be so well thought out in this environment. And that's where they were hard on people sometimes mm -hmm. and we would have critiques that were many hours sometimes for a single work we'd have this great we had the great visiting artist program where contemporary artists would come in and share their work and we had a six hour critique after each one where we were just like going over and over every little choice made but these aren't choices that were necessarily marks on a canvas um and we were just looking at artists that were sometimes designers sometimes performance artists or um, painters of very different styles, minimal, like very minimalist works and sometimes very figurative, it's kind of like neo-figurative movement going on. Um, so everyone is out of their comfort zone. You know, you have these artists who come from their background trying to consider a work by an artist who has a very different uh, area of exploration expertise and that's valuable because you you stop kind of talking the same 
the terminology has to find kind of a meeting ground. So you have all these artists in a room who care about making art, but their background's different and they're trying to find language for what they are thinking and what these different artworks are bringing up for them. Um, it was a lot of going over and over meaning and choice and all that. But as long as you really give that thought, the, the what of what you're doing, uh, was kind of background. It was always about the how in that program um, and the why, really the why, not the how. Technique was almost backgrounded too. It was really the why of what choices you were making and why you were doing that. Um, so, you know, I think in these summers, sometimes I would have, uh, we'd have open studio nights and you're only there for like six weeks and you're, you're making just work. You're just kind of letting it bubble up. And I remember doing, um, in fact, let me find, uh, some of the summers I, you had this little white cube gallery space, so sterile. One of the summer it was just really bothering me that how sterile this environment was. And I brought no work from that year. Cause I would just like, I had just created that airport painting and I just wanted to close that chapter. I didn't want to make work about that anymore. Um, and I needed to like do something new. So at this point, it's right before we moved to California. I'm just creating, um, I'm collecting these like light and shadow images and I'm writing a lot. A lot of my practice was just writing at that time. Um, and in this little white cube space, I just, I created a video that summer um, and the video uh, had a, a transcript and I just decided to write the whole transcript on the walls and kind of immerse people in this video uh, dialogue. And then I had the video playing and I had the printout of this book that I made. It was just a lot, but you had, you were able to curate these like little microcosms um, and you'd have people in the program come in and you'd have an hour long critique about, you know, the choice to paint on the wall and why is the video projected in on this wall and not this wall and looking through the books. And you just, you thought about, um, it made you be very conscientious of your choices and, um, it, it, you know, you don't get to do that kind of work oftentimes when you're like here in your domestic environment and making work that feels more encapsulated on a, like a painting is a painting and it's not about its position in the room necessarily. And in this MFA setting, I was able to curate the space and make everything align with the function. And so all the form uh, of the room and the book and the video and the walls, all of that followed from what I wanted to say in that space. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little heady right now, but um, you don't, you know, I sometimes miss that a little bit, having that uh, blank slate room to transform into its own sort of project, its own work. Um, and that's what you get in some gallery spaces. You have artists that are thinking through every aspect of what they're putting in the gallery, where they're putting it to curate this show that um, is very much embedded in the space that it's shown. And I haven't been able to do that in a while, but I got a little taste of that in this program. Um, Jason so, does that very well. Yes, he does. Exactly. So I, and I had an intermediate class with him at Westmont where he really uh, gave us opportunities to think about transforming spaces and incorporating um, sculptures, paintings into the rooms 
to create an experience. And he modeled the critique uh, format for us a lot too. And I really, I got a lot of the critique format um, from him at this, at SAIC. But one of my favorite things too about this time is while I was doing my master's and it just feels like such a echo chamber sometimes when you're with a bunch of artists in the master's program and you're just speaking the same language, even if you're artists from all these different backgrounds, you get kind of all caught up in the lingo and the ideas. And at the same time, you know, I'm retreating every summer or after every summer to Greenville, South Carolina. And when you're out and about in a day, it resets you. You just become more grounded in, in life. And you realize that this little, this kind of frenzy in every summer with other artists is this beautiful experience, but it's very intense and it's very like kind of isolated. It doesn't carry over to like other people in your life. And trying to have conversations with like family members about my art was getting harder and harder. And I think that's a problem. Um, and I want art to be more democratic. So like when I was doing that painting of my, my dad's experience, I was doing that away from Chicago where it was more illustrative of his experience, but it's also something that I could talk to my family about. And I was able to give them a visual that they cared about, that they could get involved with and use language around it that they could understand. And not in a way of like, it's not, it's not to condescend, it's just that there are different languages used in these MFA programs. And I think that they can, that's one of the downsides of such a good like, uh, postmodern education because it's a little distancing from most people in your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and then I, what I loved too about that time is I was bartending, I was working, um, uh, most days and always people are just interested in your life especially in the south people are just so like they want to hear about um you know they want to hear from their bartender and their server and uh I was always being pulled into conversations about my art because people would find out that I'm in grad school and I make paintings and and just to have to <laughs> communicate what I was doing in like 30 seconds because that's like all the attention span you get when you're when you're uh dealing with people over their supper um and just trying to communicate what I was doing became such a challenge and I'd have to think about like the rhetoric around the program and how it like does not transfer to like everyday life and I'd have to explain my paintings in a way that people like could understand and could care about. And it made work like I was doing in the studio, which I, I got out, got a lot out of like these white cube experiences. <laughs> but I realized like, I can't, if I care about the people in my life and like involving them in what I, what I do, I have to find another way of it, talking about it. And I also need to think about what I'm making. Um, because, you know, stuff like the shadow works, you know, they're, those are for me. Um, and I think people can, it's so, it's so pared down that people can just appreciate it as a picture or a photo and not, not a lot of explanation is made. So I like doing work like that more because I don't have to like give all this context and theory to it. It's just, it's a little bit more, uh, it just simplified. It distills things that I visually find engrossing into a picture that maybe other people like, you know? Uh, and every now and then I, I'd like to get involved in more theoretical work, but it was, it feels kind of like it lived in that two year span in my master's program. And I don't know how much, um, how much I care to make this over-intellectualized work going forward when I have, you know, 
a, my family here. I've got my baby and I want to be able to like bring them into my life a little bit more too. Um, mm. So we can, I would love to talk to you a long time about the painting that you made from the photograph in relation to everything that you just said, but yeah, because the the yeah, I found I found that very striking. If you go back to the painting that you did of the photograph, uh, where your sensation actually comes into. The, the photograph of the thing that was on the ground? Oh, yes. This. Yeah. That. And then the next one is the painting. Wow. There is such a difference between those two images in terms of, yes, this has a concept to it, but wow, the sense of touch and the and the sense of sort of the heart of the artist, you can have that sensation when you look at this painting, not so much in the in the photograph. I mean, the photograph's interesting conceptually, but the concept uh, overpowers the heart a little yes. bit. And yes. And to see with time, you know, your guys, the guys, you know, that, you know, I, I went to the same kind of MFA program you did, okay? Mm -hmm. Where concept was the driving force mm -hmm. and I just found after I also found it was very interesting because a lot of the work that I didn't understand once I met the artist that could explain what they were trying to do the work made a lot more sense uh, on the other hand sometimes you can look at a painting and the painting more, makes more sense than what the artist talks about in terms of what they were trying to do. I mean, I, I'm just rambling right now, but there's a, there's a sensation in that painting right there that is rises above just the concept. So I would say probably your family, you know, the average man probably can feel more from this painting than they could from the photograph. I don't know if that's right or not, but there's a there's a quality of the gender quality in the painting that comes through. Yeah, I I I totally agree. And I think that right, so much of that masters era work feels sterile or flat because it doesn't have that sense of touch. It doesn't have that like investment. Um and that's why I always want to, I feel like that urge to make paintings from photographs so much because the photograph, you know, I clicked the button on the camera. I had that, that engagement with that vision and the photographs can feel evocative maybe to other people, but it's really about like, it's, it's an engagement that I have but when I'm turning it into a painting it is adding this sense of tactility, the touch of the artist. And I think yes. that they convey very differently. And it's yeah. not just looking at an object that you know people that has that material interaction with and time. I think a lot of people look at paintings and they think about it in terms of time. I always get people asking like, how long did it take to do that? <laughs> and how many hours did it spend? And they ascribe some value to work based on how much time it took um and I don't think that's the right way of looking at it but it, it shows you people really want to engage on the material level um and paintings do that they just have this warmth about them too for people and I agree like I think that it has so much more sensation and that was like that's the reason for doing paintings at all sometimes like you can why take why make a painting if you can have a photograph because paintings have sensation um, in a different way. Depending on the painting, though, depending on the painting, sometimes paintings don't. This mm -hmm. painting has so much sensation, really, because of the way it's put together. 
you know, and where where the violets are in the painting and where the yellows are and how that violet that's sort of like in the middle down to the lower left relates to the yellows that, you know, there's a whole formal element in this painting in terms of how it comes together. And the togetherness is what sort of, I, I think, the togetherness of it and the touch uh, is what transmits actually the mind of the artist. I feel much more your heart and your mind and your imagination coming through that painting right there than say in the photograph, the one before, which is interesting. It's an interesting concept, but I don't feel Jenna as much in it. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, and to me, that's not like, this isn't like a work of art or anything. It's documentation and, and <laughs> always, it's kind of interesting. Like, what where does documentation end and like the work <laughs> begin sometimes like especially yeah. when you're taking photos and that's why I don't consider myself a photographer because I'm like I'm taking them as like a point along this path to making work and they're part of they're embedded in this like seeing the world sometimes when I'm not painting directly from the motif it's cameras are often this like additional sort of channel that a lot of the work goes through and and they often don't get it to where it conveys sensation it just helps create this like that contours of a painting it gives you the source image that you can then riff on a little bit yeah and yeah, so, so it's just I mean, more it's interesting. It's interesting because you said, I mean, I had the same thing in my MFA program. You said they focus more on the why mm -hmm. than what. Uh, and I would say when I look at that painting right there, the why and the what and the how, all three of them, the why, the what, and the how are important. And, you know, it, it comes the why and the what and the how, how actually come together in a particular kind of way. And if you separate the why from the what or the how, wow, things, um, things may not be as powerful as they could be. Right. I find this really, even in terms of what you were talking about about your father and everything that you went through your father with your father i mean i know you just talked about that now but i have a sensation that part of that experience that you went through with your father is embodied in this painting right here in, in a in a kind of strange mm -hmm. way i, I yeah. have a sense. that I mean, that's really interesting to hear too because i i start seeing those connections like the throughout all this work, which is very disparate in its style, but it does inform everything I've done in the past informs, you know, these next, the next works and- Yeah. And yeah, and even like, am I gonna say I have so much? I know we're running out of time too, but- um, I mean, God, you're so talented, you know, that's the thing you can draw, you know, you're, you've got that, that talent where you can draw make something look exactly like it look i mean i'm fa i want to hear more about that we don't have time i'll i'll call you or something i want to hear more yeah. about how you put those those cathedral paintings together i mean i don't think i don't think those cathedral paintings have as much of you in them they're sort of replicas but wow what a technique yeah and it's what it's about like how my my more recent work doesn't feel like it really harnesses that technique. Like I've been doing these like paintings like this where it's photorealistic in a way, but it's very it's very basic. It just has that element of touch more. Um, yeah, is that a painting? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Oh my god. And it's about yeah, it's like blurring edges, like letting some be crisper, and then so much of the time and the touch is in just the fusion and the gradients and um and it is technical it's i mean it's hyper realistic but it's not like perspective and and 
I just, they, these have been much more, but they feel like me too, these shadow paintings that I've been doing. Um, and what's been the most surprising corollary to painting recently for me is these wood cut prints where it's each groove, each cut away from the wood is just this like little, it's time, it's touch, it's um, chiseling away the form and negotiating these shapes and creating line where there is none and it's it was just light, but wanting to create this motion in the light passages. Um, and so that was from uh, this photo, creating this woodcut in, into this and, and making things, it's a binary of black and white, but you get to- What was the one before? Was that in a- This is the, the print, this is the wood. And I just, I love these too. Like I love when, uh, creating wow. the print you go through this very tactile experience of chiseling away the wood and before that stage though I'm doing these like fine line drawings and I'm um you know you get half the work is done when it's a shadow already and choosing is it black or is it white but when you're hatching you're creating these in-betweens um and that in-between area where you have to choose is it more black or is it more white dictates the the width of the, the chisel marks and how uh, how close together are those hatching lines um how thick are those it will be the black printed areas between them and all yeah. of these choices and you know they're here they're kind of like hatched at weird angles but just imposing sort of this movement onto this Wow. grayish gradient is was inserting yourself into the work too so it's like okay so here's this photo that I'm curating what what I like what captures my attention mm. but it, it's not I, it doesn't meet me until I take some sort of material um intervention in the image and I think carving into wood has been like the most surprising thing for me of late where I, all of a sudden I'm I'm in the line work um, in those white spaces and making those choices. That's so interesting. I prefer the wood cut. Me too. That's why I have it in here. I like, yes. I, love, I love those. And then here. Something happens to the sense of touch. Yeah, yeah. that's important. Um, Wait. No. Is that the print or the cut? This is the cut. And then this is the print. Wow. And I did a reduction wood cut here. So that's like the first pass. And then I, uh, then I carved. No, how does this work? Yeah. So it was two different like prints and like had a gray layer in there essentially, but it's all from one wood cut. So it starts out more like this where I cut away more minimally and then I cut more for a second layer. Um, that's, that's the wood cut, right? That's not a print. Yeah, exactly. God, what happens? That's very nice. And yeah, and I, I I save these because, and now it's, you know, it's all inked up and not as pretty, but I like to take a photo before I ink it because they're just, they're more engaging sometimes than the prints themselves. And I think maybe that's a failure of the print, but, or maybe it's just a strength of the process. Um, Go to where, the print now, let's see, the print. It's so interesting because if you go back to the, if you, if you look at like the flower down on in the bottom right corner, if you look mm -hmm. at the by bottom right corner, right? Or the mm -hmm. bottom right corner of the print, what's going on down there is sort of darker 
it has a different value from those beautiful one, two, three, four white flowers that are up above, sort of at the top. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to the print, go to the print, all of a sudden, wow, look, that, that becomes as the bottom right becomes as bright as everything's of the same brightness. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, the difference in the values. And part of it too is oh, it go through this very intricate process when I'm doing something like this because I I'm doing all this line work in there. Oh. So I'm take I have a photo and I'm going through this intermediary stage of looking at this grayscale. I it's a grayscale photo and I'm looking like where are the darkest areas and I'll hatch those the tightest and create this dark area, this shape. And where I don't create that line work signals to me, I'm gonna carve away. But part of the uh, challenge of the reduction wood cut is you have to do it in stages. So you have to like first think what are the lightest areas and not hatch those. But you also have to think ahead and they plan ahead to the second stage, the second lightest areas. So it made me, it forced me to be more thoughtful with my line work and create um, not just a binary of black and white, but also incorporate the grayscale yeah. more so that then I could go in and make my selections of what I carve away in my first pass of the print carve away more and then in my second pass of the print. And the result is just much more, you just detail in these shadows that you lose when you print. Um, yeah. And that's Man, why- I, you have a Ike. Wonderful. And I just, this, you know, these prints too. I like the end results, but it's the doing, the doing of them has been so, uh, I mean, it's a good, again, it's sensation. Like they're totally engrossing and just seeing this image lifted up, it's less applied, it's more lifted and seeing it kind yeah. of rise out of this wood it feels more like sculpting wood, I imagine. I don't sculpt. Um, at all but this feels like sculpting in wood a little bit but you have the drawing element when you're adding these hatching lines all across it um, and then I, I stain it in like an ochre print uh, ochre ink before I chisel away at these lighter areas um, and that's just to because it's a it's like a plywood it's very it's very light tan and it's harder to see the, because I mean, these aren't white, this is just that same plywood color. So it allows me to see where I've carved if I've stained it first. And, but it has, I mean, I love the color, the ochre color with the black. So it's a, it's so, and it works with my life right now too, where I was doing this while I was pregnant. Um, this work because I was I was so nauseous all the time and painting um was giving me the fumes and I, I I've tried to like detoxify my practice but um as much as I can but I was getting headaches and I was nauseous all the time so I wanted something that I could pick up for like 10-15 minutes and put down um and and it works now with my baby too like it's so much harder to get a palette set up to do a painting and then have like the time and just know that I'm gonna have the time because that's such a, that's that's the trick of it too. It's hard to get, you know, set in a chunk of time in the studio if I like could be called away cause he's, he's needing me. So knowing- baby. Yeah, how, old is, how old is your baby? He's 10 months. Oh my God, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so <laughs> it's wonderful. Like it's it just every month, and he's changing so quick, but it just gets more and more fun. Um, but he's my little cling wrap baby. He's he's a 
right now. So I don't get a, a lot of time in the studio, but uh, it's so worth it. But, you know, it's just to have something like I did this while I was pregnant. Um, I haven't really done much at all uh, in the last 10 months <laughs> with him, but more and more I'm strategizing my practice so that I can do it in these like little increments. And I think more and more um, this woodcut work will feature because I can just, you know, chisel a little bit here and there and, and have this long term vision for this image, but just enjoy the process and, and do it on my own time. Um, so, you know, the, the subject matter, I, I think will change a lot because I'm very interested in making work that's born out of this experience of being a mother. Um, it feels like, you know, I had these stages where, you know, I had this work that I did of my friend with the brain condition and my dad with his brain disease. And um, then I had the stage of my, my painting from that composite image that was just, uh, that felt like another chapter. I was all working responsively to the conditions of moving and people in my life, um, but, but nothing has been quite as like, hasn't given me that same sort of urgency as, um, as being a mother to Hugo. Like I have all these things I wanna, these images I wanna create because, and I don't even, I mean, for me, it's a kind of a rare thing. You And I feel really called to make an image of something and I start creating ideas around it. Um, it feels, it's always responsive to things going on in my life. But right now I just been collecting source material around like breastfeeding and this, I don't quite know what I'm making yet, but I, I just need to make stuff about being a mother. It's this entanglement with this other person and the material like overlaps of like nursing, co-sleeping and um, literally birthing him. <laughs> like is just so, it's so embedded that I have to make work about that connection, that overlap, the merging of these forms. Um, and it will be essentially figurative, but I think it'll, it'll feel, you know, like I did with this, this woodcut and this one, it's, these forms are con the, the contours of the leaves in this case are just being like explored through almost movements and getting into the, the foreground and the background are so collapsed in this kind of work. And I think that'll lend itself well to work about like my body and my baby kind of entwined. Mm -hmm. So I am really excited about the, the work I'll be making soon um, <laughs> when I have the time, but, um, but that's, the, that's the thought. That's where all of this has led but it's all driven uh, really by that sensation, that, that feeling of sensation in, in doing the work um, and in living life, like just paying attention to what, what sparks that, that feeling that you wanna convey, you wanna convey that physical feeling into like a visual um, coordinate. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good a place going to on inside. What's that? You have a lot going on inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it I mean, gosh, I just feel like I'm bubbling with ideas right now for what I want to make. Um and I have, you know, I showed you a lot. I, I covered a lot of different years. Um, and the trajectory is um I think changed the styles have changed a lot on that trajectory. Um, but it's really exciting to be in a place where I have so much sense of purpose in what I, in the images that I'm making. I haven't, 
I've had glimpses of that with the past work. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm in a good place though for, for the next body of work. I'm really excited about it, but, and now I'm, now we're moved in so I can, I can get going and have a whole studio behind me. So before I was in like a closet <laughs> in Santa Barbara and now I've got this whole room. So, um, you can go see Nanette because Nanette lives like 60 miles from you. Really? Where are you, Nanette? I am in Carlisle, the beautiful <laughs> city of Carlisle that has a flashing red light and a post office <laughs> and a Dollar General. So I'm sure you've been here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very excited that you're in Greenville. So I am going to try to connect with you and see that beautiful baby. Yes, I would love that. I'd love to meet you in person in it. <laughs> That'd be great. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jenna. This has been so wonderful. Give a little round of applause for Jenna. And are there any questions? I know there's been some throughout the talk, but um, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. We're a, a tight enough group here. I think you can just shout them out. I don't have to field them. <laughs> Jenna, this has been so great to see your whole progression and all the work you've done it's so good and I just love what you say about paying attention to what catches your attention that's like ringing in my head and I'm going to keep thinking about that so beautiful oh thank you Rose <laughs> any last questions before we wrap up I feel like time has just flown <laughs> it's been so lovely um I don't have a question but I just want to say Jenna you're super talented you're super prolific You've tried so many different things. Um, it's really inspiring. And um, I appreciate especially what you said about wanting to make work that's less like conceptual, less theoretical, and something that you could bring, you know, your, your loved ones into. Um, I definitely, that's, that's definitely something that runs through my mind a lot. Um, so thanks for not making me feel, you know, completely alone. <laughs> going through that. Thanks. Yeah, there's uh -huh. MFA programs can get pretty heady. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Jenna. We so appreciate you taking the time and um, preparing this beautiful talk in your studio looks so nice. And we'll look forward to staying in touch and, and seeing what you make next when you find the time <laughs> with that sweet baby. Oh, yeah, he's just, he's so wonderful. I'll have to, <laughs> it's hard to extricate myself, but. but of I, course. Yeah. Oh, well, so thank sweet. you for everyone so much for, for joining today. Um, thank you. <laughs> lovely. Thank, thank you. you. So, much. so lovely. Real, Thanks real, everyone for joining. Real, real. Thank you. Bye everyone. Talk to you all soon. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Jenna. Bye. Bye, Alan.